Alrighty, so in this video, we're going to talk about how you form stationary waves and some different applications of stationary waves. But to understand stationary waves, you first need to understand the principle of superposition. And it's very simple. It states that when two waves meet at a point, the total displacement at that point is the sum of the displacements of the two waves. Uh, so if the waves are moving particles, the particles will have displacement of the two displacements added together. And the same works with electromagnetic fields too. So that's what you can see in these diagrams. You've got two waves heading towards each other, and once they reach the same point, you can see that the resulting displacement is the two displacements added together. But once they've passed through each other, they go back to being separate waves again. Okay, so that's superposition. So a standing wave or a stationary wave, as they're sometimes called, is a specific type of wave that doesn't transfer energy from one place to another, hence why it's called a stationary wave. So what it is, is really it's a store of energy. So an example of this would be the strings on a musical instrument like a guitar. So what you do is you pluck a string and it vibrates up and down, but the energy is not being transferred from one end to another. It's the string is simply vibrating backwards and forwards. Okay. So another example of stationary waves would be forming them in air instead of on a string. So that's how most wind instruments work. They form stationary waves inside the tubes of the instrument. But again, they don't transfer energy. OK, so the simplest stationary wave to create is on a piece of string or on a slinky. So sp stationary waves are only formed under certain conditions and they are all of these conditions have to be met to form a stationary wave. So you need two progressive waves, and they have to be traveling at the same speed, have the same wavelength, and have a similar amplitude, and then they need to superpose on one another while traveling in opposite directions. So those conditions are very specific, and you need all of them. So the easiest way is if you fix one end of the string, and you oscillate or vibrate the other end, and that way the wave gets reflected back on itself. So the fixed end is going to stay exactly where it is. The wave gets reflected back on itself. And as long as you don't absorb too much energy in the reflection, you're going to form a stationary wave. And this is pretty much what's happening when you pluck a guitar string. Okay, so that's how you make a stationary wave. So the the first thing we describe with a stationary wave is what we call the fundamental. And I'm going to show you an animation of what this wave actually looks like in a second. So with a fundamental, we have two things called nodes at either end. And these are points where there is no displacement. So these are like the two fixed ends of a guitar. There is no displacement at these points at any moment in time. And then we form these other things called an antinode, which is a point that has the maximum displacement. So the displacement is still changing with time, but the antinode is where the maximum displacement occurs, and it's midway between two nodes, as you can see. Okay, so as we saw there, we can make a fundamental with two nodes at each end, but if we double the frequency at which we're vibrating a string, we can get what we call the second harmonic, where double the frequency. The third harmonic would be when we have three times the fundamental frequency, and the fourth harmonic, you guessed it, four times the fundamental frequency. Um, so that's one way we can make these harmonics. The other way we can do it is by making the string half as long. So we can achieve the same effect by changing the length of the string as well. And when we double the frequency in musical terms, we describe that as going up one octave. OK, so we're going to look at some examples of music instruments in a second, but just to give you a general idea of what's happening with a guitar. So the there is these parts at the top of a guitar are called frets, where you put your finger on to change the length of the string. And if you put your finger on the 12th fret, what you are doing is you are halving the length of the string, which doubles the frequency of the note you're playing, which means the note is now one octave higher than the open string or the string with no fingers. So there's an equation which describes the different variables that can affect the frequency and therefore the pitch of the sound. 
So you can see from this equation, if you increase the tension in the string, it makes the, fre the frequency higher. If you make the length of the string longer, that makes the frequency lower. And if you increase the mass per unit length of the string, make it thicker essentially, that also makes the frequency of the fundamental lower. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what that sounds like on a real guitar. Uh, so let me grab mine now and show you. Uh, so a really good example is the guitar. So this one would be an acoustic type guitar. So as we've just seen, there are three things that can affect the frequency at which you get a string to vibrate. The tension, the mass per unit length, and the length of the string. So the first, the easiest one to show you with a guitar is the, how the length of a string affects it. So this string right here at the top is an E note, and it's about 320 hertz in frequency. So if I put my finger on the 12th fret down here, what I've effectively done is I've halved the length of the string, which is why we get a note that is double the frequency, which is still an E note. It's just an E note with double the frequency, so it's an octave higher, is how a musician would describe it. And that works with the same with any of them, so this note down here at the bottom is also an E. But if I put my finger on the 12th fret, it becomes an E again, but double the frequency. So halving the length doubles the frequency. That's our first thing. The other thing we can do is we can change the mass per unit length. So if I show you a nice close-up, uh, see if you can see it, the string right here at the top is really thick, and the string down here at the bottom is really thin. So the way they are different, they're the same length as each other, but they have a different mass per unit length because this one's thicker, which is why this makes an E note that is about 80 hertz. This one makes an E note which is about 320 hertz, or four times the frequency. So changing the thickness or the mass per unit length also can change the frequency. The last thing that can change the frequency is the tension in it. So this is uh, how the top string is supposed to sound. So if I increase the tension by tightening this part up here, you can hear the pitch of the note goes up, and that means the frequency is higher. So now I'm up into an F sharp, and I can keep going up into a G and go higher and higher and higher, but I don't really want to break my string, so I'm not going to go much further. Or likewise, if I decrease the tension of the string, you can hear the pitch goes down, and that means the frequency is going down, and I can get it back to where it's just an E again if I, well I tighten up quite a lot. So it's an E note again. And one of the things you notice with musical instruments is certain notes sound good together, so uh, we call those chords. So for example an E chord is made up of the note E, another E, but with a B as well and with an A which have different frequencies, but put them together they make a really nice sound and we can use those to make songs and if you know four chords, you can play pretty much any song that you can think of. And if you want, don't believe me, check out um, Axis of Awesome and their four chord song, and you'll see that most songs are just four of them. Um, so that's way, essentially the waves or the stationary waves we get on a string. And uh, we're going to move on to look at the stationary waves you get in an air column instead. Okay. So that essentially look is the waves on a string we're now going to look at stationary waves in air columns as well so there are two, two different types of stationary waves we get depending on whether the container in which the air column is in is closed or open so we'll first look at closed so with a closed end the air cannot move through the other end so we form a node because it's not allowed to vibrate at the fixed end and we form an antinode at the open end. So what we're looking at there is a quarter of a wavelength, which means the length of the tube is going to be one quarter of a wavelength. So that's if we have a closed end. If we have an open end, what we get is an antinode at each end. So when you've set up the fundamental, that means the length of the pipe is exactly half of the wavelength, or if we multiply the length by two, that tells us what the wavelength being produced is. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is again show you another instrument to, so you get an idea of how this works. An example of a air column being used to produce station waves. Uh, this is the top piece of a saxophone. 
So the way this works is you have this bit at the top called a reed, and when you blow on it, this vibrates up and down like this, and that forces the air inside the instrument to vibrate, and it forms a stationary wave. So you can see that it's open at both ends, so effectively what we're doing is we are creating, we've got an open tube here. So this is one of the hardest things to do with an instrument, is learn how to get this part to vibrate, so you start to make nice sounds. Uh, so here goes. Okay, so this is a really high pitched sound because the length of this air column is really short. So what we need to do if we want lower notes is to be able to attach it and make the air column longer. And that's why you need one of these bad boys. Um, so this is the rest of a saxophone, so let's put that back together. Um, so what we can do is we can start changing the length, but you can see this end is still open, so we're still forming an open air column. So uh, let's give it a blow. Okay, so now what we can do is get a much lower pitch note because our column is much longer. So you can already hear the pitch is low and I haven't even put any of these keys down. But what you do is, as you put these keys down, what I'm doing is making the length of the saxophone longer, which means you get a longer wavelength or a lower frequency. Uh, so it sounds a bit like this. So what I'm doing there is I'm just adding one finger at a time, and you heard the pitch of the note go down and down and down, and that's because the frequency of the stationary waveform went further and further down. Okay, so that's an, an example of air columns, and that completes the musical instruments for today's video.